of just 22 yards and it's up and good. 40 yard field goal attempt from Soslo is up and it is good. Hold there and the kick is good. Here individuals who are Next up, we have Jack. Hi, I'm Jack Soslo. I'm a partner in the games team focused on AR, VR, games infrastructure, and AI. Let's go, baby. We got another episode of the Athletes and Assets podcast where I have current or former elite athletes teach you a business topic. And today, my goodness, we got to go to a man. We got the 2015-2016 uh, Ivy League champion. Uh, 2017 first team all Ivy kicker for the Penn men's football team, Jack Soslow, who is now a partner and Andreessen Horowitz. Jack, what's going on, man? What's up, Noah? Thanks for having me. Oh my goodness. This is a good one, guys. Do not like, let me, I bring the best of the best on. Okay. So don't tell me, don't tell me otherwise. All right. So Jack, we got to skip the small talk, man. Um, so the Quakers two and zero. Going into Dartmouth this weekend. Mm -hmm. My my question to you: Do you believe? Of course. You think I wouldn't believe <laughs> <laughs> in my boys? <laughs> hey, with Aiden saying at the helm, no question. No question. These guys are good. Dartmouth is also good. Okay. When I was in college, they were one of the better teams in the Ivy League. The first year, my freshman year, they absolutely destroyed us, and then the second year, we beat them. Yeah. But uh, I think I think we have a shot. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. feeling good. I'm feeling good. Okay. Well, if if you got in that locker room during pregame, give me the punchline of your speech, right? Like everyone ends ends with something, and I have a punchline, so I'll share mine. If I were to give a football, pre, you know, pregame speech, what what would your punchline be? What does it take to be great? Okay. You're going out there. What does it take to be great? Put your life on the line. You give it all you got, and this is an opportunity to be great. Opportunities are rare. You go and capitalize on it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My thing is like, you show them the appetizer, now give them the whole meal. <laughs> 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 I think I took that from the Colorado. I think someone in Colorado said like that. D like Dion? Yeah, Dion or yeah, someone yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, that was the appetizer. Now I'm going to give you the whole meal. What was the, it was the, the Oregon coach was, um, we talk with our pads. Talk with your pads. Talk with your that's pads. A, that's that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. Rooted in substance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're not worth your time. Yeah. That's a, that's a good one. It, it, in that Colorado, Oregon game, when Oregon just whooped them and Colorado was talking shit all pregame. Am I allowed to curse by the way? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. When they were talking, I feel like at a certain point when you're up 42-0, you're allowed to talk your talk a little for bit. Sure. For certain, sure. Like talk with your pads a little bit up until the point where the game is over. Then you can talk a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You deserved it. Yeah. Just to let it out. Those guys are, <laughs> it's boiling inside of them, you know? Like, yeah. No, that, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they said some stuff. Of course they did. Yeah. They should. They deserve it. Yeah. But then, but of course you still focus on the next week, but like you're, you're in the game, you know, like let them know that it's not okay. You have to retaliate a little bit when someone talks. Sure. Shit to your face. Yeah. For sure. For yeah. sure. And I don't know if you saw the cinematic video of Oregon's recap, but oh, Colorado so was talking met, like yes. before the game. Yes. I think Shiloh or someone said, I'll beat the hell out of you and your coach. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. You got to say something after that. After that, at that boat whooping. Of course. I think they, they felt like they wanted to talk more shit to Colorado state. Yeah. And then had to get it out on Oregon, mm. which was the, which was the mistake yeah. because Oregon was, Far better. Yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. couldn't back it up. They see, that's the thing about talking shit is like, you should only be able to talk shit when you can back it up. Yeah. Or once you've already won. It's like a genetic uh, optimal solution is you can only pick fights that you win. Yes. <laughs> so if, you, if you lose a fight, your like genes die out. So yeah. like, uh, you better, you better be going in knowing that you're going to win the fight or that you've already won the fight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, I'm glad that you believe and glad that you've been watching Colorado football too. Um, is it true? So did you even play football in high school? Yes. Only you my did. senior year though. So you played football, you're just your senior year. That's right. That's right. So I played soccer my entire life. Yeah. Um, my, I was on the high school team. We were actually like one of the best teams in the state. Right. And then only played football my senior year because of a weird happenstance, if you want me to go into that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go into it. Let's, let's talk about it. So I was just hanging out with my like two friends who were on the football team. They knew me as the guy on the soccer team who could kick the ball far. 
Yeah. Like that's what I was known, known as. Just like the guy, the center back. When you're in like middle and lower school, the center back's job is just to kick the ball to the other side of the field and let the kids run at the pizza. That was my role. Uh, in high let school, the kids run at the pizza? Run at the pizza. That's like what my dad, my dad, like that was his coaching mechanism was like, hey, just go toward the ball. Okay. And eventually like- You'll, you'll get some pizza. Okay, got it. Yeah, you get got the it. pizza. You yeah, get yeah, the yeah. pizza. Um, but in high school, like elite level soccer, that's no longer the, the optimal approach. So I was like good at soccer, but I wasn't like elite, maybe yeah. like a D3 level soccer player. They knew me as the guy who could kick a far. I would take like our six yarders and I'd just be able to like rocket shots, those yeah. things. They were like, hey, why don't you try kicking a football? And I was particularly good at it to the point where I only played football when they bet me. It's like, of course, it's a bet, but like 55 yard kick. If you make this, like you have to play football. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. So I make it. And then I give up on soccer immediately. Like this was, this was something I was training for, for at this point, like 14 years of my life, the coach of the Haverford soccer team, like relied on me. He was also my club coach. And for me to let him down, quit my senior year when we were battling for like state championships was a big deal. But like the next day I called up the football coach I was like, Hey, I think I'd be a good kicker for like the high school team. He took me out to the field. Like it was just us two. We kicked two two field goals and two kickoffs. He's like, all right, like we want you, should we call coach Brady? who was the soccer coach right now. We call coach Brady, me and coach Murph, high school football coach. He's like, Hey, I'm sorry, but like I'm playing football next year. It was two weeks before camp. So oh my gosh. yeah, that's how, that's how I started playing football. And, and you I got guess, recruited that last, you just got recruited that last year. Did you think college football would even be a possibility while you were playing football your senior year? So kind of, um, not at first, but it wasn't until I realized that I was significantly better than the other high school football players, like the other high school football kickers, that it could have been an option. Yeah. And then it was like halfway through the season, it's like, hey, like, it's kind of like football recruiting season. Like, if you want to play, and like early decisions are going out soon for, for college. I'm like, if you want to play, you got to talk to coaches. So I would like talk to the Ivy League coaches. I would talk to like some of the other coaches, but it was like still too early in my career, had nothing to prove. At that point, I actually didn't get recruited for football. So I was first team all state my high school senior season, but didn't get recruited anywhere. I didn't get recruited at Penn. I didn't get recruited at Harvard. I didn't get recruited anywhere. Like, but I did get like preferred walk on spots at like some D one schools like Virginia and Duke. Um, but I got into Penn for for academics. And at this point in my life, I was like I was kicking for whatever like three months at this point. Yeah, and I was being a, an academic athlete for fourteen years. Um, so I was like, all right, I'm just going to go to the best school and figure out how to walk onto the team. Yeah. We also talked to the coaches for Penn ahead of time saying like, Hey, is it possible for me to walk on? It's like, no, <laughs> Wow. There, there are three kickers on the team already. Jeez. There's no spot for you. Um, but I was like, all right, I, I, I care more about the, the academics of the operation. So I'm going to go to Penn regardless and force my way onto the team. So I did essentially that. So like I, I got it in the summer before my freshman year of college, what I did was I literally just sat in the coach's office every day for like two weeks. <laughs> Didn't I, I, just, just, you just sat there. I, just sat, I, I like, I snuck my way in through the door. Okay. I sat in like the, the lobby area and I waited for people to walk by and be like, similar to your founders Inc tactic. If, yes, if, exactly. Okay, getting into the, the door. <laughs> you you, you just wait until someone lets you in and yeah. you, just, you just walk in and don't ask questions. You, you pretend you'd be there. Oh, I left my key yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm looking for coach P or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you walk in, you sit there, you wait for the coaches to walk by. Eventually you're like, Hey, I would like to walk onto the team this year. They're like, uh, I'm not the right guy. Like I work for the equipment staff or whatever. Yeah. And then like after the third day, you find like the middle linebackers coach. This is who I found. Talk to him. I'm like, hey, like I was first team all state. Like I want to play for Penn. Like what is it going to take? This guy's all right. Like let me put you in touch with like the head of like football operations. His name was Jake Silverman. Um, got in touch with him. Jake Silverman's like, yeah, there's, there's no spot for you on the team. Yeah. But like you should go and play sprint, sprint football. Sprint football is essentially football for people 172 pounds and less. <laughs> I'm like, I'm six two six three, weighing like naturally 190. Yeah. Like, eh, screw it, whatever. I'll play sprint football. So they're like, okay, go play sprint football. I'm weighing down to like 170 pounds. And then again, two weeks before the season, freshman year of Penn, Jake Silverman calls me up. He's like, yeah, we have a spot for you. Like come, come to training camp. So wow. put on a little bit more weight, uh, start like prepping, like figuring out how to put on like real pads, that sort of thing. Get out to camp. Um, yeah. And I'm on the team. Wow. And then, I, and then once I walked onto the team, I had to figure out how to make a name for myself with on the team because they didn't even have a locker for me. They didn't have equipment for me. They didn't have nothing. What they did was they sat me in the corner of the locker room with like uh, a fake Jersey with like fake pads and fake helmet. 
And it's like, okay, like go and kick balls today. And then like I, I progressed like a video game. Like <laughs> yeah. Like you start off with in a video game, what you do is you start with like no equipment, no attire, nothing. And then you have to work your way up to like levels and that sort of thing. So no jersey, nothing. Um, first day of practice, kick balls before practice because it's not they're not gonna put me in like during regular practice. Coaches see me he's like, oh, he's pretty good. Um, let's get him like a real jersey. So I get their jersey. And then like let's I get him some cleats, maybe some some <laughs> things that could actually help kick the ball even better. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um and then, like, eventually kicked, like, one ball in practice, make the kick. And then I get, like, um, a helmet or yeah. like, real pads. And then eventually I get, like, a metallic locker in the back corner of the locker room. And then so on and so forth mm-hmm. until, like. Build up. Uh, yeah, build up. And then <laughs> years later, you got, your, you know, I, what is it? I was a 70, 80% field goal. I mean, field goal kicking percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, 2017 All-Ivy League selection. Mm-hmm. That's incredible, man. Um, and. And of course, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but I, I wanted to to get to this point where you, you're a key person on the team. You're kicking, you're scoring a lot of points for Penn, but we got to talk about the dynamics of being a kicker, man. Mm-hmm. Like this is the being a kicker is not for everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It is a thankless job, and it's high pressure. How of, of a thankless job is it? Like, what is the dynamic of a kicker, for in your opinion? I was trying to think of like an analogy for this. I would describe it maybe as like being a professional yo-yoer on a basketball team. <laughs> it's like so outside <laughs> of the realm of like what that's the normal. Good, okay, that's it's solid. Like, that's it's solid. Like, it's like so irrelevant to the actual practice of the the sport. Like football is like a fucking gladiator. Sport. Yes, you know, like literally banging heads together to form a line because we're gonna figure out how to get. It's like the ultimate team sport. Yeah, like quarterback is not successful if the line is not successful. He will not be successful if his wide receivers are not successful. And then, like, even if the defense is not successful, the team won't win. So there's, like, a whole series of operations that need to happen for any play to work. And then there's the kicker, which is, like, <laughs> the worst. <laughs> it's, like, so irrelevant beyond the scheme of the game. And, like, what, what we do to practice is, like, some minute task that has, like, no purposeful skill in the real world. Um, what this means, in effect, is that, like, these gladiators feel like a team. And the kickers are secluded from the operation. You're so the, you're the yo-yo guy on the basketball team. You're the yo-yo guy in the, it's like almost like a clown, right? Like, like literally the yo-yo guy in the basketball team, like a clown, but he's so important to the team that people have to rely on him. Um, so there's this feeling of exclusion that you don't belong, et cetera, that constantly permeates the kickers on a, on any individual roster. So what you do, um, you lift with the team, you make friends with the team, you try to prove that you are an athlete. For me, like, I'm athletic, but I'm athletic-ish. Like, these guys are, like, top 1% athletes. Yeah. Um, so, like, I had to be an artificial athlete, put on weight, try to look like a tight end. Like, this was my favorite thing when I was in college. I'd be like, I'd go talk to some people at a party and be like, oh, what position do you think I play? Because uh, you're self-conscious about being considered a kicker. Mm. It's like, it's actually almost a little demeaning. Um, huh. I feel like it'd be a flex. It's a, it's a, now, especially if you're active on, I don't know. Now, now I consider it a flex. Yeah. It's like, yeah. But the way that the way that kickers sometimes describe themselves is the fourth down quarterback, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is, which I think is a better flex. Uh, Cause like you're, you're super important in that, in that context, which is true in any football team. The kicker oftentimes is the highest point scorer. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. In, I think in the NFL, it's like seven and of the top ten, po- like highest point scorers are kickers or something like that. It, no, no diss and no diss to the Ivy League football, but I can't imagine that you guys had a run and gun offense where you're dropping fifty five points a game. I mean, your points probably matter. That's, that's, <laughs> that's goddamn right. It probably matters. <laughs> if we made it to the thirty yard line, it was a big deal. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 yeah, no Patrick offense, Mahomes on, was good. Our no Patrick was good. Mahomes on the Quakers. Well, uh, speaking of Patrick Mahomes, we actually had uh, one guy on our team, Justin Watson. Yeah, who plays for the Chiefs right now? Actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah, fifth round draft pick. He was great. What position? He was a wide receiver. Okay. Yeah. Hey, he gets I don't know, like four targets a game, about that's, 40, 50 yards. Like, I mean, he's legit. That's legit. He's super legit. Yeah. He's, runs like a four three. Hell yeah. Athlete. So like hell hey, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. D- no sleep, we, yeah. We're D one football. Yeah. FCS. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Hell yeah. No, 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 FCS. FCS. Um, I'll give you I'm, I'll give you your props there. I'll give you the props. Yeah. So it, the I guess like part of your question is like what goes into the mentality of a kicker? Yeah. Um a lot of people say that it's like brutally it's brutal mentally. It is. But over time of just getting flogged constantly mentally. Like, literally embarrassed constantly. I just don't get embarrassed anymore. I actually look forward to, like, high-stakes situations or things that make me nervous. It's like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to go and do something better than I would have otherwise. 
It's uh, they say that clutch is not taught. I couldn't agree with that more. Mm. Clutch is definitely a skill because when I first started to kick in these high pressure situations, I could never make it. And then over time, I adjusted the way that I thought, kept practicing, practicing, practicing to the point where like in these high pressure situations, I had a higher success rate. And it's, a, it's a little bit of a mental trick to sure. get into that, get into that operation. But like you have to really train it. Like the things that I would do to train mentally, it's absurd. Like there's a series of different tactics you can do to train like your mental skill as a kicker. Um, some of them is just you go into practice and you have like people yell at you. Like you would have the kickers, like they would, they would joke with me all the time. It's like, Jack, you're a little bitch. And they're like, yeah. they're like right, be, right before I kick, they would like try to punch me in the face or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like literally try to get in my head. Some other things that, would, that I would do when I would practice is I'd have my headphones in. I'd be on a call with my parents. And my parents, as I take my steps back, as I practice, be like, Jack, we don't love you. <laughs> okay. All right. Wow. All Jack, right. You're adopted. <laughs> right. But Jack, we love your brother more than you. Like those sorts well, of things to get in Well, your head parents are in your head bef- bef- in like you have head AirPods or something right before you kick and your parents are like. <laughs> yes. Yes. To try and get in my head. Because like when when you go before these games, you know what you know what happens is the other team tries to Saying the same thing. They say yeah. the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A little bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's oftentimes, you know who it always is? It's the other team's strength coach. <laughs> it, well, they, they get out there know. early. They get out there early. They like kick my football out. It's a little bit. It's like, yeah. I'm going to miss your kicks today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in your head. It's like, well, one, you are a little bit in my head, but I'm not going to let you know that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but two, what you do, what you do over time is like, you learn how to address it, how to address like people trying to like get into your mental. Yeah. The way that you do it is you focus entirely on the kick itself. Because there's two, there's two types of kickers that I like to say. The first type of kicker is one that tries to take them out of the situation. And one's like, oh, I'm just gonna rely on muscle memory, like blank everything out, blank everything out, like just go out there and do what I normally do and it'll be successful. Yeah. And then the second type of kicker is one that is hyperactive and that's what I am. I was so focused on every little thing that I had to do, everything that was in my control. Things that were in my control was like when I went to go towards the ball, how I took my steps, how I put my plant foot pointed towards the right location, how I like swung through the ball properly and how I found the ball when it was placed. Like those sorts of things are the things that I focused on. And I would train them like that yeah. all the time. Like when I was walking down from my apartment to practice, every chink in the sidewalk, I would look at and pretend was a kick. Just like focus, yeah, <laughs> focus yeah, yeah. on every corner of the sidewalk, like kick. kick that's like, kick. that's the same <laughs> thing when like, like hoopers are like, you know, like crossing over at yes. the grocery store and like euroing <laughs> and like in the aisles. <laughs> Yes, you're, you're, it's, it's, yeah. it's the same thing. It's the same. And I'm sure like as hoopers, you know, like the, the ultimate dream is five, four, three, two, one game winning shot. Yeah. And you, you run that, you run that sim constantly. I was doing that when I, when I used to hoop, like you just, you, you hit the game winning shot all the time. What you do as a kicker, you, you hit that game winning kick in your head constantly, yeah. constantly all the time when I'm sleeping, it's just like dream over and over again and a whole wide variety of situations. It's like, here's one that's in a divot. On the here's, 50 or the 40 or exactly. the different angles of the field. You're the different teammate, like all of these different situations. And just, you're getting mental reps. Yeah. Uh, and you have to train it mentally. So what happens in these high pressure situations is you're actually more focused because the pressure is so much, it's like there's more pressure. Yeah. So these are like, all right, time to lock in. Yeah. And then you're like literally more focused on every single step. Wow. Every little thing. Versus in like the low pressure situations, the shorter kicks and an irrelevant game. It's like, oh, fuck it. Like, I'll just go through the motions. And then those are the ones you miss. So you had to, so you had to, yeah. the, this podcast is business focused, but I just learned so much right there about <laughs> like, I didn't know kickers had this approach, the separating the two types of kicker mentalities. Mm-hmm. That's a whole nother level, man. That's, that's pretty awesome. And, and I love the yo-yo, the yo-yo player on the basketball. Team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, man. Well, dude, I, I appreciate you, uh, Sounds like you had, I mean, you had an awesome career there, man. And um, kudos to you for getting that Ivy education and, uh, you know, scoring some points there. Um, I miss it a lot, man. Yeah. Like, football you, was you, so much fun. You sound like you do. Yeah. yeah. It was so much fun. I yeah. look forward to any high stakes situation I get into now, but they never happen. Like in the real world, like nothing matters as much as a football kick where everything relies. Like, wow. There's like literally nothing matters more and you just don't get that anymore. Wow. So uh, I look forward to those things, but it, yeah, it just well, doesn't. Well, I'm sorry to dull the, the conversation down moving forward, Dude, I but, it. <laughs> but I, I, maybe, maybe I can set the stage to make it uh, somewhat more high stakes. Um, I saw, I read some, something recently that 
the, the gaming industry today, if you combine the, the movie and music industry, it still doesn't beat the market map of the gaming industry. That's insane. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Gaming is huge. It's massive. It's massive. The market is like... And it's evil. the only one that's growing, too. Like music as a, as a market, declining. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe it's flattening and like streaming is eating a bigger cut of it. Um, movies, declining. Gaming, increasing every year. Yeah. And, and, and like, were you, um, were you interested in gaming during college? Is this, obviously, did you play video games growing up? Where does your games passion come from? Yeah. So I think like a lot of kids, I grew up on games. Yeah. The games that I grew up on. Yeah. Were, talk to me. Talk to me. What you got? RuneScape. Okay. League of Legends. League. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Modern Warfare. Black Ops. Yes. Minecraft. Okay. And then the, the weirdest one that I actually maybe spent the most time on. Actually, there's, there's more. But, like, this one is called Realm of the Mad God. Oh, it's, it's a different like the, one. Yeah, it's, it's a like a, a little different. PvE bullet hell game. Uh, the premise is you and a group of friends. It's your job to kill a bunch of enemies. Okay. And then as you progress and as your like group progresses, you can kill stronger and stronger enemies by leveling up your character. Now the the trick of the game is it's permadeath. So if you die, you lose everything. So um, and because each individual player had interactive effects with their teammates, you don't want anyone in your party to die. Yeah. Because that makes you weaker too. So it's a very collaborative game. And I had a ton of friends on this game in high school. To the point where it's like, I actually think I have closer friends on this game than I do in like real life. Yeah. Which, uh, like in some ways it's depressing, but in other the, ways, the web three like, community will appreciate that. They like yeah, that. Yeah. They like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Zuck in the metaverse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So man, so you're, you're at Andreessen Horowitz right now as um, a games investor. So mm-hmm. clearly you like it enough to where you, you know, you want to be on the frontier of gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, I, while we're here, I was a big FIFA guy. Mm-hmm. I love FIFA. Nice. Call of Duty. Um, but the developments that we're seeing in gaming with, obviously, and, and you prior to A16Z, sorry, let me give proper context. You were at Oculus, mm-hmm. right, doing data science, and um, you, you've sort of been around games. Uh, you've seen it from a technical perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you played it, which is, you've been off clearly both sides of the table here. Mm-hmm. Um, can you chat about a little bit about what, what you're looking at in the, in the games industry and, and what you and your team, um, you know, has had their eyes on lately in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. regards to gaming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the world of gaming, the biggest trend right now is going to be just AI related. Things. Okay. Um, gaming is in a state where tech was around like the early 2000s. Whoa. Where, yeah. So what old, old way of building tech was build your own servers, build your own um, databases, build your, build everything yourself. Like yes. it, it took like Twitter or Facebook like months to build. Now it takes Twitter or Facebook, like the final project of a first year CS student in college. Games, on the other hand, it takes like three years to build a game. Three years and $500 million to build a game. The Last of Us, for example, I think it took like five plus years, $300 million, and I think like 2,000 employees. Why is it so expensive? Because there's so much content. Yeah, because there's so many variables within the game. It's, the, I mean, yeah. So consider a game almost like an interactive movie for like these single player games. Yeah. Um, and all of the branching paths that you could go down. For each of those dialogue trees, there needs to be a new line that's uh, voiced by the same actor. For every different basement, there's like new assets. Yeah. And a 3D asset is not easy to make. Yeah. Like the way, the way, the way you make 3D assets nowadays is you modern day like Da Vinci's are like sculpting shit in Riot Games. Like, they go in, they go in, there's, like, 100 3D, like, designers who are just, like, sculpting stuff yeah. in, in 3D software, like Blender and Maya. It's crazy. And they do this all day. So what wow. happens is when you, when you look at something like um, The Last of Us 2, which is, like, 2% engineers on a massive project, you think, like, that's crazy. Like, how do, how, do we, how do we improve that process? And the easiest way to improve that process now is with, like, the generative AI stuff. Yeah. You get content at scale quickly and cheaply. Some of it isn't production ready. It's not production ready across the whole board, but people see it on the horizon. They've seen it, they see it with text. Anybody with two eyes can see it with image. Same on the horizon with like audio, 3D assets, video, et cetera. Like the, it's going to really reduce the, the cost it takes to make games. And it's not there yet, but it's, it's, it's trickling away. It's going gonna, it's gonna to turn this like $500 million project to 50, to five. Yeah, to, I, I was going to ask like, 
it sounds like you are interested in, in, in where you, you're seeing is how do we make games faster and more efficient? Mm-hmm. And that's actually a, a, probably one of your investment focuses as much as the game itself. Is that is that a correct statement? Or? 100%. Okay. Yeah. And there's, a, I mean, there's a million different ways to do it. Yeah. The old way of making games was everything's in-house. I build my own engine. Like, I don't know. Have you read Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow? I have not read Tomorrow, Tomorrow, Fantastic tomorrow. book. Okay. Yeah. If you, I'll go if get it Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow. Hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, the, it, it goes through the, the process of making a game in, like, the early, like, 2000s, something like that. Um, and they're making their own engine. They're making their own assets. They're making their own code. Slowly but surely, like, pieces of this process have been turned into tech and tools over time. The biggest slices of the pie. For example, it started with the engine. Unity, Unreal, Godot. Like, those are engines that now are, like, permeate the games industry. The only people who build their own engine nowadays are, like, top-tier game studios. Yeah. And, and like, even the top-tier game studios aren't even using, like, their own bespoke engine. I'd say, like, the, the majority of them are just using, uh, like, boilerplate, Unity, or Unreal. Hmm. Um, and then there's other things, like multiplayer uh, services, networking, those sorts of things. Like, why does every single game studio have to rebuild, like, the multiplayer stack? It's actually a very hard technical problem. So why doesn't like one person do this at scale? This is it's like the classic way of B2B SaaS. Every company was running their own internal CRM on Google Drive. Yeah. And and then Salesforce comes along and like yeah. professionalizes the process. Yes. Every company is um building their own like old school like servers. Insert AWS. In, it increases the ability for people to build their own software rapidly yeah. over time like re- significantly reduces the cost and complexity of making software same thing is happening with games just like more and more pieces of the stack are coming up and then the, the, why is it taking so long it like it hasn't been a market so tools tech infra generally only 10 percent of the market that it sells into so say for example games is a 200 to 300 billion dollar market if only 10 percent of that end budget can go into tech and tools then there's only so many opportunities that are big enough for a smart engineer to go and tackle with a startup. Yeah. So, but like as the industry goes, there's more and more grows, there's more opportunities. And then now people are seeing more opportunities to expand the industry with AI. Yeah. And then like some of these other markets. As well. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's, there's tools to develop games faster and quicker. Mm-hmm. There's the game itself, but also like what I didn't realize being a, a, a novice to the sort of the game market. Mm-hmm. That's why we brought you on here. Um, <laughs> the, the famous games that we come to play, they're created by studios. And so, like, uh, there's, the gaming studios that their job is to incubate, you know, certain games. It's not just, like, you know, Fortnite or Call of Duty. Is It's, like, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, that's the company. No, mm-hmm. it's, like, a bigger company, right? And you're investing in those as well. Like, mm-hmm. what do you look for in a gaming studio that's a green flag for you guys? And it's, like, okay, we want to put money behind those guys because I know they're going to build some really cool shit. Yeah. 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 Number one biggest indicator if someone's going to build cool shit is have they built cool shit. Sure. Yeah. That's okay. like the number one, number one thing. Okay. And then also, number two thing, do you understand the world? Do you understand how people work? And do you understand the market that you're building for? Yeah. What is the small little thing that you are adding on to what people already understand that you know they're going to grok? Like you have to, you have to really understand people to build something great. And then games industry, it's like a, it's a whack industry, right? Like it's totally different than other industries. Like the, the studios who build the games, each studio might have like Activision, for example, might have like a series of different games. Activision, who, what games have they produced to give content? Call, Call of Duty. Games. Call of Duty. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But they don't build all the Call of Duty games. <laughs> they <laughs> don't. Like, so that sometimes they outsource the games to like Infinity Ward to build some of the Call of Duty games. In another studio? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why would they outsource? Okay, go ahead. That's, that's, that's I didn't, okay. Because uh, they have they have the motion down. So um, there's a whole bunch of different pieces in the games industry. They're the studios who make the games. Studios oftentimes have a bunch of underling studios that also make games that roll up into their umbrella studio. Um, a good example of this, um, I think, yeah, Activision Blizzard is like the best example of something like this. There's just like a whole series of different studios that build a bunch of different games in that umbrella company. Then what those studios do is they build the game and then they look for publishers. What is it, publishing? Publishing is the motion by which you sell the game. Yeah. It's like, it's like um, essentially marketing for games. Um, games marketing is a pretty complex process um, of which like you need deep platform relationships. If I want to build a game and I want to make money, I want it on the Xbox store. 
you know who gatekeeps the Xbox store? Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> so what Xbox, and it's also in Xbox's greatest interest to have the best games on their platform. So what Xbox will do is they will cut a deal with you to have your game on their store bespoke for one year for like, say, 20, 30% of revenue or something. Wow. Like that. Yeah. And that's, that's, and that's different. It's different than like traditional venture capital investing. Like why is this different than like venture capital investing? Because these publishers are essentially investing in the game to make themselves money. The difference is that like a venture capitalist is investing oftentimes in the person and the studio who can make multiple games. Yeah. And they're building a company that might like roll up into multiple studios. Yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit different. Like the publisher funds one game. Venture capitalists fund a studio and a person oftentimes. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different. Yeah, uh, that's super helpful. Yeah. No, that, that's that's uh, that's fascinating. And you, mm -hmm. um, what do you what are you seeing these days, man? You said AI, obviously AI. You're you're big in AR VR as well. Talk about that. Like what what are I mean, the Oculus came out, right? You had um, Pokemon Go, which was a uh, you know a big deal. And and first of all, Andreessen has been in some really awesome companies, right? Uh, Roblox, Zynga, mm -hmm. um, and you know the, these are these have shaped some of the games that we've played for the longest time. A16Z has been true believers in VR. We invested in Oculus itself before yeah, they yeah. even had like a sold product. We invested in like the earliest stages of VR apps. Uh, there's this company called Within that built Supernatural VR, which is like fitness in VR. We invested in Big Screen VR, which uh, created essentially like a virtual theater in VR that now also launched a headset. Wow. Um, we invested in the past two years, this almost like second wave of VR companies. We invested in Prisons VR, Gym Class VR, Alta VR, Trask Games. There's a series, Ready Player Me. There's a series of different VR companies. Hey, shout so, out, shout out, Jack. By the way, Jack. Yeah, yeah, Jack, Jack. Where you at? <laughs> I think Jack. I think Jack's downstairs. But could you try, I think Trash Games. Trash Games. Is what you just not Trash Games. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. Uh, I don't know if I'd invest Jack in that. Thoughts. One. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you should. You should ask Jack how they came up with the name one day. <laughs> yeah, okay. I will. Yeah. I will. <laughs> um. But uh, yeah, no, it's a. Uh, so what are we seeing in the AR VR market? Yeah. And uh, what do we predict what's going on there? So. At large, why are we excited about AR, VR? We're excited about it because humans are, have been, we've been optimizing for 3D since we were arboreal creatures. Yeah. <laughs> like literally since we like could understand 3D space, the world, this is how we've operated, communicated, transmitted information, navigated. We've been optimizing just biologically for 2D since like the invention of written language. So like that's how information has been transmitted in like more recent times. But yeah. like biologically, we're not wired for this. And it's very hard to update biology. It takes generations to do so. It's a very lossy optimization function. So it's going to be a long time before essentially technology is going to catch up to the way that we're wired before our wiring catches up to like the information that we're communicating, like uh, that we're that we're navigating with today. Yeah. So what this means is the way that we want to play games, like the the conversation I'm having with you in 3D right now is a more visceral conversation than the conversation I would have with you via Zoom. Yes. The game that I am playing with someone in 3D where I am literally tagging you with my hand versus like having my avatar run over your body in 2D yeah. is like a totally different visceral experience. Wow. The feeling of throwing a dart, the feeling of shooting a basketball, the, the, or dunking a basketball, yeah. or kicking a football. Like those are real, real feelings. Yes. Like core biological games that we've played for years. Like, the feeling of predator prey instinct is like so ingrained in our body. Yeah. This is why we play tag as kids. Um, hide and seek. Like these are like the like horror games. Like those are things ingrained in our biology as like since we were born. Yeah. Right? Like this these are the types of games that are great for VR and like the experience of VR. Now, beyond this, reality is very noisy. We there's too much information all the time. Um this water bottle has like extra words on it that I'm not going to read because it's too noisy. Yeah. Uh, I walk down the street and there's like motorcycles blaring. I'm, I go on my phone and there's like 10 notifications. Like my phone is blaring right now. It's just like such a distraction all the time. <laughs> yeah. What VR enables you to do is gives you complete immersion, complete presence in one experience. That yeah. feeling of you putting on noise canceling headphones for your eyes, ears, nose, mouth, everything. And you can be deeply immersed in one thing. So what are some applications that are great for that deep immersion? Education, right? Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, distracted while I'm learning math concepts. Honestly, I want to learn math concepts while I'm navigating like 3d space. I want to learn how to, I want to learn chemistry in the lab. I know exactly. I know exactly where you're going with this because um, there's a really cool company that you guys are investing in prism mm -hmm. that does this basically virtual reality. Um, you know, 
to learn different concepts. And so mm -hmm. um, if you want to learn a math equation, you know, there is an opportunity to, to put on the headset. You're l worried about calculating the slope and there's like a calculator on the, the like, that's pretty cool. And I, I want to give a shout out. Baron Davis says this all the time. Like the best way to learn something sometimes is to gamify it. hundred percent. And I think that's a, a powerful tool. Application. Why, do, why do you think that is? Because I don't know. I feel like humans are, are just naturally playful creatures. I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, the way, the way that I think it is, is because it captures your attention. One of the prerequisites for learning any new material is that you are focused. Yeah. This is, this is also like, shout out Huberman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is so SF of us. Um, but like, <laughs> he'll, yeah. he'll tell you that like nicotine helps you learn new things. Why? Because it gets you locked in. Like you're focused. Yeah. I don't do nicotine, right? But like, um, it's like you need to be focused in order to learn something new. Yeah. So like gamification, you put a kid in front of Minecraft, they're like locked in for 30 minutes. You put a kid in front of a textbook for 30 minutes, they like it's the last thing they want to look yeah, at. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, so so basically you're saying what, when we're gamifying something, you're actually enabling natural focus. Yes. yes. Versus I mean that sounds a lot better than taking a bunch of Adderall. Yeah, Man, you know, like that, that, I mean that sounds like a much healthier alternative. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of things to hack my biology. Not to like be a biohacker nerd, but like there's if I set up workstations that I know that I'm going to work at, yeah. Every time I look at this, like if all of my senses expect me to work at this desk, yeah, then I'm going to work at that desk. Yeah. Every time I listen to this one piece of music and I code, when I listen to that piece of music, my brain is coding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like those those, those sorts of things. Just yeah. like hack your biology. Yeah. No, that's super cool. I, I'm wondering, like, from a job perspective, I want to get involved in games. I want to help build something. But I'm not necessarily technical. What's, like, the most popular non-technical role you could have at, like, a gaming company? Is it marketing? Like, what, what, what's, like, what's your take there? So the most popular, it depends on what you consider technical. Because, like, I think artists are pretty technical. Okay. It's just, like, a different type of technical skill. Oh, sure. Design. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, you still need to learn some pieces of software. Okay. In order to become, like, a great designer or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, if you wanted to be a great 3D asset designer, you need to learn, like, Maya and Blender and, like, figure out how to get those. And, like, UV unwrapping and yeah. retopology and all of these, like... <laughs> I don't even know the... <laughs> let, me, let me throw out more buzzwords. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the... I'd say the most popular... It, it, marketing is a pretty big budget for, for every game. Yeah. Um, you build a game, you need to sell the game. Oftentimes, games have massive marketing budgets. They're riding thin lines between profitability. Like, there's a lot of mobile games that are, like, operating in, like, 10% advertising margins. Yeah. It's, like, three-year paybacks, which is crazy. Wow. Um, but, it, I mean, it's, like, the, it's the way of the world. They need to figure out how to optimize the creatives and those sorts of things. Then there's other roles within games companies. Um, one of them is called the producer. The producer's job is essentially, is, like, the product manager of a game. Align, like, make sure the timelines are aligned. Yes, uh, work with the engineers, make sure they're working on the right stuff. Same with the, the 3D artists, make sure everyone is coordinated and aligned. Uh, make sure that you have the right strategy. Uh, make sure that you're communicating with leadership properly on these timelines. Like that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good, pretty good uh, job. I think for like an athlete, especially like great leader. Yeah. 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 I, that, that, and that's where I was, I was going to go with that. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like I had a conversation yeah, in a previous episode, shout out my guy, Jaron. Uh, we were talking about, yeah, yeah. We were talking about, how so many athletes love gaming, but they don't realize it could have a significant impact on the other side mm -hmm. and like influence and build a game. Now I know guys get wired up for 2k and like, you know, play, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about literally designing the game, thinking about the game, you know, from a leadership perspective or organizational perspective, really designing the plot lines, et cetera, you know, those roles, right? Like, I, you know, you don't see those. I don't see those just pop out at LinkedIn. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, how can we like get more involved with actually building the games and stuff? Aside and and I, <laughs> aside from going on like the portfolio jobs at ACC, <laughs> you know, like it was the number one thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry, I, I would get ahead of you there. But <laughs> so, uh, what I would recommend the best way to get into games is to play games and make games with your friends. And this is not what you would think is like making games. It's like you go into 2K and the game that you make is like you and your friends decide not to play like a traditional game of 2K, but you're playing like three point contest mm. or you're playing like, um, I don't know, dunk contest or whatever. It's like a different machination of the game itself. Yeah. These are called mods. Mm. Like it's a, a modification of the game. And then there's tools, like very easy tools to go and make these mods a reality. 
So instead of like using the scaffold of the game itself to like play the game, yeah. what you do is you then, um, you like create a modification of the game, change like three lines of code and maybe one asset, and then boom, you have a new game. Then you start making these games. Then what I would say is like, there's a ton of job postings, things like game designers, producers, marketers, those sorts of things that you can find on LinkedIn. Um, but I, I honestly like, just generally in any industry, it's like the best way to get into the industry is to do the thing. Yeah. Um, and, and trust me, like anyone can make a game right now. You go, you go on Roblox, you can make a game. Like you can go Unreal, like UEFN, you can go and make a game. Itch.io, like you can go and make a game. There, like there used to be a hard technical barrier to go and make a game. Yeah. Not anymore. Um, especially with mods in these in these platforms. So the barrier to entry now is it's 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 relatively easier to to, to get into a, a gaming company and um and are they're based now like most gaming companies are based in LA or there's some stuff here like you know geographically right if there was this, if it was an in person setup <laughs> and I wanted to build the next Fortnite with the boys right like mm -hmm. are we doing this in LA SF uh, you know where, where do you see the most gaming action the so. I'll give you an answer that's that's false to show my operation. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> the right the right answer is LA. Okay, <laughs> like LA is the center of entertainment. Yeah, but like the answer that I want it to be is SF. Yeah, and it depends. It depends on like what type of job you're going for. If it's more of like the technical jobs, the jobs that sell into game studios. Um, say if you want to build the next back end as a service for games, boom, come to SF. Best place for it. If you're trying to make like the next Fortnite, like get get into the entertainment industry. That's in like that's in mm. LA. Yeah. Yeah. So I just blew up your, I just gave up your loop, <laughs> man. Everyone, all the other investors invested in games. He said it. And I mean, <laughs> Robin, um, Robin Guo is going to be so happy with me that I said LA is the, is the place to be for game studios. Yeah. But no, my, my operation come to SF, come to SF. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm yeah. a supportive of that as well. Great. I'm supportive of that as well. Um, awesome, man. What are you looking to see in the next five years with the transformation of games? You know, you know, Jack, I feel like we haven't hit a wall, but it was Fortnite, Call of Duty, 2K. You know, these are household names. I could throw it to my grandma and she'd know at least 2K. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the next one of these mm -hmm. and why? Like, what, what's going to be the next big game? So there, there are big games on the horizon. Yeah. Um, you just haven't seen them yet. So the, so what? <laughs> well, here's the curtain. Let's peel that bad boy back. Okay. While <laughs> so you could, you could argue that there are certain markets where games are saturated. Say the mobile market. Like, I don't think there's going to be a ton more innovation in the mobile market, right? You like, don't think there'll be a next, another Angry Birds or... There will be, know. there will be more Angry Birds in the future. Like, there have been, there have been games that have come up and, like, really taken the zeitgeist on mobile. Things yeah. like Survivor.io or Honkai Star Rail. But those are, like, minor innovations on a genre, like, on a platform and uh, that, that has, pr that has existed for a while and people have figured out almost, like, the global max yeah. of, like, what is, what is possible there. Ish... With consoles, like, people expand the maps. Like, I don't know if you played, like, uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Incredible game. I did not, man. I, st I, have a, I, got, I stuck with the sports, surely sports <laughs> games. I don't want to be basic here, but I had to admit it. Uh -huh. I would, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. I used, to, I used to play Madden, like, no one's business. Yeah. I, I love competitive games. I'm yeah, a very yeah. competitive person. Um, but, like, there's, there's, like, some console games that have, like, broken into the zeitgeist as well. But, like, we're ascending towards a, a global max on, like, these 2D platforms. Now, what do you need in order to generate something that's like so novel and so crazy are new genres. Yeah. One of these newest genres that we're super excited about is this extraction genre. The, the, premise, the premise of the extraction genre is you and a group of friends, you go into some dangerous world, and it's your job to get stuff out of that world. Like Indiana Jones. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indiana Jones genre. Okay. That's a way better name. Actually, I, think that, I think we should just call the genre the Indiana Jones genre if you're I like being it. honest. Yeah. I like okay. it. Actually, you know what? Like, someone should make this game. Like, yeah. <laughs> yo. Well, like, I mean, well, first of all, Indiana, Indiana Jones is a video game. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Like, do saying. it Do it extraction genre style. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Someone someone go make that game. <laughs> A16 will fund it. Don't hold me to that. <laughs> um, but th this extraction genre, pioneered by this game called Escape from Tarkov. Okay. Um, go in, get stuff out. Oftentimes you go in, you can't get anything out. Uh, it's like 95% of the time you can't get anything out. Um, so people look at this game, Escape from Tarkov, as particularly inaccessible. It's a dark medieval fantasy, really complex systems, all these, all these different things. Yeah. Um, so now there are new games that, that go and expand on it. Uh, a game called Dark and Darker makes it a little bit more accessible. Yeah. And then, like, we've seen a whole bunch of other things. Like, uh, think of Fortnite with the Battle Royale genre, right? Yeah. Before Fortnite, there was PUBG which was a big game, but yeah. it, was, it was too inaccessible. And then Fortnite made it popular. So we're excited for something like that. Then there's new genres on the horizon that we haven't seen yet. The biggest new genre that I'm excited about are, is the AI-enabled genre. And what does this mean? 
So think of like the history of games. There's been skill expression that has been tactical or mechanical. Tactical is like, I am smarter than you in chess and I can get checkmate. Or like, I can place my characters in this auto battler in a better way to kill you. Or like in Madden, like I call better plays than you. Tactical. Mechanical is throwing it to the right player. Mechanical is going into a FPS and shooting you in the head. Like those are the two types of skill expression historically. Now the new type of skill expression that AI enables at scale is social skill expression. Mm. All of the different ways that you can flirt, coerce, wow. um, chill. Like how good's your chill? <laughs> All Riz. Is, yes. <laughs> Riz. The, Riz, the Rizometer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Riz, Riz, Riz skill expression. These are like literally dating sims. But I mean like there are games like this that exist but are, are hard to do at scale. I don't know if you ever played like Mafia. No, I didn't. You never, you know, uh, if you played like One Night Werewolf or there's another game called Diplomacy, the premise of the game is like you have to deceive. Yeah. You have to laugh. Among Us is a great example of like social skill expression. Mm. Are you good at like deceiving other people? That's now possible at scale with AI, LLMs, those sorts of things. And then and then there's new platforms. Yeah. AR, VR. The type of game that works in AR, VR is so unlike any other game that exists anywhere else. The, 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 the number one game in AR, VR right now is a game called Gorilla Tag. The premise of the game is you pretend to be a gorilla and you run around like this and you tag people. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like a fancy name or something. Yeah, pretty yeah. self-explanatory. Like pretty simple there. Yeah, that's it. And it's the yeah. number one game by far. Wow. So there's like all of these new genres, new platforms, et cetera, that make us excited that there are more new games to come. And yeah, and like there are going to be people who make new and better mobile games and new and better console games. And it just keeps getting better and better and better. Compare the best game of the world today to the best game of the world in 1980. Yeah. It's like massive difference. I, I can't. I cannot play Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It is like a bad game <laughs> compared, compared to like the, the Zeldas that exist today. Yeah. Now compare like music from the 1980s to music today. Like music from the 1980s, pretty good. Yeah. Like it's pretty good. Movies from the 1980s, garbage. <laughs> right. But like you can, you can see how like games are ascending on this like mastery curve. We've yet to hit the global max. There's so much more that we can eke out. Wow. Yeah. So I, I'm very, I'm very optimistic for what's to come. Well, you, you, you can't hide that. That's for sure. And <laughs> I appreciate you, uh, you joining the pod and, and, and sharing a little bit about what you're seeing on the frontier. So uh, this has been an amazing episode with Jack Soslo, partner in Andreessen Horowitz. Jack, man, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, my friend. Cheers. All right. That's a wrap. Awesome.